The next item of business is a debate on motion 12861, the name of Rhoda Grant, on a review of government FOI handling and record keeping. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Rhoda Grant to speak to and move the motion. Eight minutes, please, Ms Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The intervention report from the Scottish Information Commissioner exposes the utter contempt in which this SNP government holds the freedom of information law. In publishing this damning report, the Scottish Information Commissioner has done the principle of open, openness and transparency a great service, and I truly hope that it is a wake-up call for the Scottish Government. FOI legislation was enacted to make government more transparent and to improve scrutiny. Yet this government has done the opposite. They refuse to be held to account and they refuse to be scrutinised. Questions, particularly written questions in this parliament, get a poor and evasive answer. So members are forced to use FOI legislation and get the answers they should have been provided with in the parliament. But the Scottish government seek to block this as well. They single out journalists, MSPs and their researchers for special treatment. They are subject to a greater scrutiny and sign-off, less likely to get answers, and those they do get take longer to receive. The report states, by creating and applying a process based on requester type rather than the nature of the request, not only is the spirit of FOI legislation offended, but trust between those groups mentioned in the policy and the Scottish Government may also be damaged. This is not just important for those of us in the political bubble. It's important to hold the government to account and it is important to understand how and why decisions are made and who influences why they are made. The meetings that government ministers have taken part in are matters of public interest and national importance. Therefore, we're calling for an independent review on how government handles FOIs and their overall record keeping, another area that they have fallen short. For example, we have a transport minister meeting with the chief executives of both Stagecoach and the first group with no minutes taken, nor any agenda prepared. We have a first minister alongside, with her, as, alongside her finance secretary, her education secretary, her economy secretary, inviting a host of business figures to dinner at Butte House, including SNP donor Brian Souter, again with no minutes or agenda. It's outrageous that Scottish Government ministers think they can have such covert meetings and ride roughshod over FOI legislation Absolutely. and Absolutely. indeed the law. Absolutely. And this means that even the Information Commissioner is unable to track the government's behaviour and decision-making pro process. The report states where da data is absent or unclear, it was excluded from our analysis. Therefore, this report is only based on the findings from government's better re record keeping. We can only guess what is being covered up by their worst. Whether by intent or negligence, poor record keeping of the very process that was enshrined in law to make government more transparent makes it less so, and that's extremely disappointing. The Information Commissioner's report stated that it could not be clear what, the, what role special advisers had with regard to FOI. Their involvement varied between department. He stated there was little guidance on their role and whether it impacted, impacted on responses given. We all know that special advisers have a role in helping government in a more political role, but this should not allow them to evade the law or indeed the spirit of FOI legislation. If the information that is requested is available, and not subject to any legal exclusion, then it must be provided. That is the letter and the spirit of FOI legislation, and it must be adhered to. Simply wrong that a government that should be leading the way and providing a good example has behaved in this way, and it must stop now. If I qu Very quickly. Stuart Stevenson. Um, I speak as someone who ceased to be a minister six years ago. Um, and who for three years after being a minister continued to be asked for confirmation about FOI responses. Who in government should be the person who contacts me to ensure that the FOI responses that are being made and are being checked with someone no longer in government, some years after it, who should do that? Rhoda Grant. 
it surely is for the minister to ensure that the answer he is giving to FOI requests is the right answer, because ultimately it is the government that is responsible. And if you need to depend on a special advisor to help you hide information, then that is not good for governance and not good for transparency. And if the question that's being asked is to disclose information that's embarrassing to government, then it's their job to answer that question, but also to put right the wrong that was uncovered, not to seek to hide it. It's not un only underhand and evasive, it's illegal. If poor record keeping is being used to disguise that, that's even worse. It also begs the question whether this additional level of scrutiny is what delays answers to journalists, MSPs and our staff? Or is there a culture where information to those people is deliberately delayed in order to kill a story or indeed a line of inquiry? The report talks about the lack of training for staff dealing with FOI requests and there appears to be no formal training at all. Surely this is untenable. These staff need to be trained in their legal obligation of transparency and surely they must also be trained on how to provide this information in a way that is accessible. The government has in excess of 1,000 people involved in FOI work but still has no formal training is unbelievable. Therefore, we strongly suggest that this is put right as soon as possible. Presiding officer, all these problems stack up to create a pretty damning report. There is little that is good in this report. The only thing that stands out is that there has been an improvement. But that improvement only happened after the information commissioner stepped in, and it does not go far enough. Furthermore, if this is what improvement looks like, we can only imagine how bad it was previously. This catalogue of errors reflects very poorly on the government. We expected the report to raise some failings in the system, but reading it shows that there were failings after failings after failings. And these failings may not always have been done with intent, but carelessness is hardly an excuse when it prevents proper governmental scrutiny by opposition parties, backbenchers and the press. The government amendment removes from our motion the concerns expressed by the Information Commissioner's report. And this is disappointing because it shows a lack of understanding of the seriousness of these findings. They also talk of consulting of ex on extending FOI to companies providing services on behalf of the public sector. And we would support the extension of FOI to these organisations. However, they have to go further than consult. They have to commit to legislate on the outcome of that consultation. They also have to put their own house in order so that we can have confidence in the system and indeed its extension to non-governmental service providers. Presiding officer, we need a new approach to FOI. We need one that we can be confident of, one that can withstand independent scrutiny and most importantly, one that adheres to the letter and the spirit of the law. Thank you. If you want your motion voted on, you better move it. No, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, can I call on Joe Fitzpatrick now to speak to and move Amendment 12861.2, please? Thank you, President Officer. In moving, six minutes, tight six minutes. In moving the amendment in my name, I'd like to thank Rhoda Grant for giving us the opportunity to further debate the Scottish Information Commissioner's intervention report. This report... This debate also allows me to set out the improvements being put in place to ensure our processes and performance meet the highest standards required and expected of us. This Parliament can be rightly proud of the Freedom of Information Scotland Act 2002. The legislation is rigorous and is well regarded internationally, a position we have sought to maintain with incremental changes to the legislation. For example, the 2013 Amendment Act paved the way for lifespans of key exemptions to be reduced from 30 years to 15 years. The Act has also been extended to bring within scope numerous bodies, including arm's length trusts, providers of secure accommodation for children and young people, and private prison contractors. The Scottish Government takes our FOI commitment seriously, and the Scottish Information Commissioner's <coughs> intervention report published last week, was a serious assessment of our FOI handling processes. I'm, of course, pleased that the report identifies examples of good practice, but it also highlights areas where improvement in processes are needed. As I informed members last week, 
The Scottish Government has accepted the recommendations in the report and will develop an action plan by the 13th of September this year. I, th I think I'll make some progress, if that's OK. In uh, turning to today's motion and its call for an independent review of FY handling, I'd hope that no member would doubt the independence of the Scottish Information Commissioner and his staff. Indeed, in responding to calls last year for an independent inquiry into Scottish Government uh, request handling, the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointment Committee agreed that the Information Commissioner might be an appropriate person to undertake such an inquiry. I am therefore slightly surprised that today's motion appears to call for another independent review of FOI handling. Perhaps uh, the Labour Party are unconvinced of the Commissioner's independence. As Neil Finlay. Before he moves on, I wonder if the Minister could tell us how many times his government have broken the law in relation to FOI. Minister. <laughs> the, the, the member comes to a point which I think Andy Whiteman um, raised during, during, during the statement. Um, and and the, the conclusion that was made that, that implied that the government um, was, the report was somehow suggesting the government broke the law was not a conclusion that the report makes itself. The commissioner's inquiry, the commissioner's inquiry was a level three intervention under section 43.1 and 43.3 of FOISA, which relate to best practice. And it is my intention and my determination that the Scottish Government will become an exemplar in best practice. And this report, this report will help us to achieve that aim. As re um, reflected in the, the Labour motion, the Commissioner's report highlights the Commissioner's, Commissioner's report highlights a number of areas where action is required, including around clearance, training, case handling and records management. The report is thorough and is being considered in detail by officials. However, as I notified members last week, we have revised guidance on our clearance processes with immediate effect. So where some of the language that Rhoda Grant used was saying that this is what we do, this is what we did. And we, I have signed off um, new guidance which changes our processes around those matters. Um, that and it directly addresses recommendation three of the report in respect of the treatment of requests based on the class of the requester rather than the sensitivity of the information sought. A revised guidance, which, as with all our guidance, is in the public domain, makes clear that uh, consideration should be based on the information that is requested rather than the identity of the requester. In addition, and uh, addressing issues raised in recommendation four and six, we anticipate that the in introduction of a new tracker system and the updating of the Scottish Government's electronic records management system should significantly improve request monitoring and record keeping. I'd again confirm that the agreed action plan will be published and I'm sure the Scottish Information Commissioner will make public any report um, into uh, the Scottish Government's implementation of the action plan, so they, therefore we will be supporting the Conservative Party's amendment tonight. The Commissioner also noted concerns about the case uh, file and, and uh, record keeping of case handlers, and we will, of course, address the Commissioner's concerns around record keeping in developing our action plan. Uh, a vast amount of information, um, of information is, of course, proactively published by the Scottish Government um, on its website. This includes um, government um, spend uh, data and a range of ministerial information. And I'm pleased to announce that from July, this will include ministerial travel and uh, subsistence expenses. My amendment confirms that the Scottish Government accepts the Commissioner's recommendation in full that, and will develop an action plan by the September deadline. The amendment also acknowledges uh, the, that improvements are still required on response times in terms of journalist requests. As set out in the Commissioner's report in 2017-18, the average response time for media requests was 19 days compared to 17 days, and we are going to fix that. As well as the 2013 Amendment Act, the Scottish Government sought to ensure our FY legislation remains fit for purpose by bringing forward two orders extending coverage of the Act. We've also consulted on a draft order extending coverage of FOISA to registered social landlords. Uh, the terms of that order are currently being finalised. However, against the backdrop of uh, ever-changing public service delivery landscape, where services traditionally provided by public authorities are now being provided by the third sector, 
or private contractors. I am conscious that there are increasing demands to look again at the scope of coverage of the legislation. In particular, I wish to credit the Liberal Democrats um, for keeping this issue of coverage very much on the radar, and we will therefore develop proposals for co consulting on further extension of coverage of the Freedom of Information Scotland Act, for example, to companies covering services on, uh, public, uh, on behalf of the public sector. Our proposals will reflect changes in the delivery of public services I'm sorry, and Minister, help to must ensure conclude. that FOISA remains fully effective in keeping those respons responsible for delivering public services to account. I urge members to support the amendment. Thank you. Um, sorry, we're very short for time. There's no time in hand. I now call on Edward Mountain to speak to and move uh, Amendment 12861.1. Five minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It was Tony Blair, the architect behind the Freedom of Information, who later said of his creation, Freedom of Information, three harmless words. I look at those words as I write them, and I feel like shaking my head till it drops off my shoulders. You idiot. You naive, foolish, irresponsible nincompoop. Well, the Prime Minister then went on to say, where was Sir Humphrey when I needed him? <laughs> well, I'm no supporter of Tony Blair, nor indeed Sir Humphrey, and I firmly believe that the Freedom of Information Act strengthens our democracy and is intrinsic to holding the government of the day to account. The Scottish Government might not like that, but that is democracy. And that's why I'd like to move the amendment in my name, which calls on the Scottish Information Commissioner to publish an annual report into the Scottish Government's performance in handling FOI requests. And I'd like to encourage all members to support my amendment, which, to, which seeks to strengthen scrutiny and ensures that the Scot Scottish Government is made accountable for their performance every year. Why do we need this? Sorry, um, sorry Mr. Whiteman. Andy Whiteman. Yes, thanks very much for taking the introduction. I just wonder if you could clarify, if the member could clarify, the, the amendment talks about making public the report on the government's implementation plan of the action plan when approved annually. The commissioner has committed to publish the action plan that's provided, but I'm not aware that he's committed to um, publishing any annual implementation plan. Could the member clarify that? Edward no, Mountain. My, sorry, signing on. So it's not my understanding that the Commissioner has agreed to publish it annually, and that's the point that I would like to see, is that it is published annually so we can see how the government is performing. Now, this investigation that we've been talking about by the Information Commissioner came about because of a motion I lodged last year which condemned the government's performance on handling FOIs and called for the independent inquiry, a motion which led to the government, we should never forget, condemning themselves. The res resulting report to me is a damning uh, indictment and shows the true scale of the issue, a government trying to cover its tracks and bury bad news. If it's not for the porpoisy of information in case files, then it's the unwarranted interference from special advisers. I, for one, am deeply uncomfortable with the way special advisers are used by, their government, by this government, having experienced their reprehensible behaviour during the forestry bill. In his report, the Scottish Information Commissioner rightly questions why SPADs were checking FOI responses before they were released. The, the SPADs say, we can advise, but we can't instruct. But how many are sticking to that code? To me, the shadowy fingers of SPADs mark many FOI requests. One example in the report showed a SPAD asking the case handler, and I quote, grateful if you could reconsider the information you pro propose to release. Now, presiding officer, if you said words to those effect to me in this chamber, I would take it as an instruction. So would most people, and the SPAD knew exactly what they were doing. They were giving an instruction. So let's be clear, because this government... Will the member take an intervention? Uh, I, I will indeed take an intervention. Stuart Stevenson. Um, is that an instruction that the provider of information looks further to ensure there is additional information not provided, or is it in some other term? Edward Mountain. I think the very fact the way it's phrased gives a very clear indication of what's being achieved. It didn't ask for more information, it asked for what information was being released and whether it was right. So to me, it appears to me that the government's guidance on handling FOIs is lacking and special advisers are constantly overstepping the mark and undermining the Freedom of Information Act. My colleagues sitting beside me and the journalists who are watching this will all have examples of Freedom of Information requests being delayed or ignored. There is clear evidence that this government treats FOI requests from MSPs and journalists 
differently, which goes against the applicant blind principle of FOI laws. When it comes to FOIs, we should all be treated the same. Presiding officer, this Scottish Government is based on secrecy and control. MSPs and journalists know that getting information from the government is like drawing blood from a stone. To get the right answer, you have to ask the right questions, and you probably have to ask a sequence of them to get to the bottom of the information you reasonably requested in the first place. To me, that is deeply disingenuous, and we are, placed to, sorry, we are forced to play a cynical game just to get information which should be in the public domain. Presiding officer, democracy is not a game. Democracy requires governments to be open, transparent and accountable. And for me, it's time this Scottish Government was de democratic. Thank you. And there is no time in hand, so strict timings. I call Andy Whiteman, four minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, presiding officer. I welcome this debate. I uh, endorse everything in the Labour motion. Seems unkind to be here again giving the government another kicking, but hopefully this debate that was engendered by the concerns of journalists over a year ago uh, will reinforce the importance of freedom of information. The intervention report makes sober reading, and I commend him and his staff for a very comprehensive piece of work, which beyond the specific case being investigated, I think shines a very useful light on Scotland's freedom of information regime uh, more generally. Just in response to Neil Finlay's intervention of earlier, I would quote in paragraph 140 from the Commissioner, there is nothing in FOI law or the Section 60 Code of Practice which permits authorities to treat certain groups of requesters less preferentially uh, than others. And I'd remind the government that it can only do, do what is permitted by law. Notwithstanding that, I commend ministers for having accepted all the recommendations. Scottish ministers are the most powerful public body in Scotland. The regime was introduced to enable the public to have greater access to information uh, held by elected bodies and public authorities. FOI is uncomfortable for those uh, with power, but it's a vital part of a transparent and open governance. And I'm proud that this parliament introduced the regime, which is amongst the best in the world. But FOI is only a small subset of transparency. Rhoda Grant's motion talks of records of meetings. Uh, I've been studying recently the government papers in the National Archives relating to how the Scottish office and the Scottish ministers lost control of key powers relating to the governance and finances of Holyrood Palace. I've been struck by, 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 the, by the detailed memos, notes and letters which provide great detail on the affairs of the Lord Chancellor's Office, the Lord Chamberlain, the Royal Household and the Scottish Development Department of the time. It's therefore vital that comprehensive, meaningful, accurate and substantive records are kept of the affairs of government and public authorities. And in this regard, I just want to draw members' attention to uh, paras 173 and 174 of the Commissioner's intervention where he says that the examination of Scottish Government case files revealed significant gaps in the information recorded. In many cases, there was scant information contained in case files. In some, there was no documentation, uh, whatever. And this is an excellent example of how an FOI regime can be gold standard, but if the information doesn't exist or has been suppressed or has been deleted, it's rendered ineffective. A further example of the need for a broader debate on transparency is the announcement today on consultation on draft regulations to establish a register of persons with a controlling interest in land. Ministers say this will be free and that's welcome, but the bigger problem is that access to information on the land to which such persons have a controlling interest, you have to pay. It's behind a paywall. It costs £30. Scottish land, Scotland's Land Information System, or Scotless, was launched last year following a commitment by John Swinney to provide a comprehensive source on the information on the ownership, use and value of land. The system was launched late last year but is useless. Business users, of course, get an excellent service. Instead of paying £30, they only pay three. Moreover, data on land owned by overseas companies has been published by Registers of Scotland, but it costs you £1,500 plus VAT to obtain, while the equivalent data is made freely available by the Land Registry in England and Wales, and the UK government's committed to creating the largest open land data set in the world. Just some examples of the need for wider transparency. Presiding officer, five years ago, some journalists and campaigners, including myself from Scotland and Ireland, set up an informal FOI club. We collaborated on methods and sources. I am now in Parliament. Rob Edwards and other members of that FOI club now run the ferret, a key part of the campaign by journalists a year ago. FOI matters to everybody. We need to open up all the sources of information and data that sit behind paywalls in government since we're already be falling behind the ambitions set by the Tories at Westminster. Now, I don't want to be in that place and I hope ministers agree with me. Thank you. Thank you.
It is four minutes, Mr. Four minutes. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Officer. I'm grateful to the Labour Party for bringing forward this debate. Um, for probably one significant reason, it allows us to retell the story of Alex Salmon's tartan trousers, where he managed to avoid, for over seven months, telling the public exactly how he'd managed to get the taxpayer to pay for a £259.40 pair of tartan trues on his visit to China. Now, the significant point about this is that it took a journalist seven months with repeated freedom of information requests to try and get the information out of the government. Now, who really cares about that? Who really cares about Alex Salmon's tartan trousers? Well, I do, because I do, because it speaks to the wider problem, which is the Scottish government's addiction to secrecy. Even for such a simplistic issue, such a simple issue as a pair of tartan trousers, they were prepared to run a campaign for seven months, certainly. Um, Neil Finlay. Whilst I couldn't really care much about uh, Mr Salmon's sartorial inelegance, what I, what I do care about is the fact that he and ministers go to Qatar to flog our public services to the Qatari Sovereign Wealth Fund. And we have to FOI to find that out as well. Absolutely right. Mr. And I'm Rennie. sure he bought a different pair of tartan trousers when he went to Qatar as well, because they weren't good enough for Qatar. Um, but there is a, I was intrigued by what the minister said in response to a question from uh, a Labour uh, member about has the government ever broken the law? And he dodged the question. And that was quite intriguing. He gave an answer which wasn't quite an answer. And I would quite like him his summing up as to whether he can be clear about whether the Scottish Government has ever broken the freedom of information law. Because the dodging of the question, I thought, told a bigger story. But also this, this report is quite damning because it shows that journalists and MSPs were prevented from doing their own job. They were prevented from doing the scrutiny that we are elected to this parliament to do, to ask, to get information out of government, to expose the performance of government, not just of ministers, but of government as a whole. But special advisers were overruling officials to make sure that information was not being made public. Information was missing. There was a disregard for the statutory guidelines. All of that speaks to that addiction to secrecy that I have mentioned. So I want to see the action plan. I want to see the progress on the action plan. And that's why Edward Mountain and his amendment is absolutely right. But going, getting that right, sorting out the addiction to secrecy is not enough. Because of the, the expansion of outsourcing by, by government, the exposure, the coverage of freedom of information legislation has reduced. Now, we spend about £11 billion on public procurement in the public sector. Um, a lot of that is in private companies. Now, we've made some progress in the last set of changes. That is true. But there are still a lot of private companies that are not subject to the scrutiny that I think they should be subject to. So I'm pleased with the government's amendment. We worked on, with them yesterday uh, on this to make sure, I presume, that they weren't defeated in the parliament today. But nevertheless, it is progress. And I want not just to see a consultation. I want to see real change and a commitment to real change. Because we should be following the money. We should be following taxpayers' money to make sure that the freedom of information regime covers all of the public spending, not just that that's strictly within the public sector. So I welcome the move today. I welcome the fact that we are able to make some progress, but we need to make much greater progress if we are going to change the addiction to secrecy that has got a hold of the Scottish Government. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Rennie. Open debate, speeches of four minutes. Tight four minutes, Daniel Johnson, followed by Ben McPherson. Mr Johnson, please. I think it's uh, uh, often the case that when people talk of democracy, they think of voting. When they talk of parliament, they think of powers. But the reality is, is that democracy and parliament is reliant on much more than just those simple, narrow factors. Civil liberties, rule of law, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, but transparency of government too are all vital to the work that we do in this place. Government of the people, for the people, demands transparency because without it, we cannot know what the government is doing in our name and in our interests which is why the Freedom of Information Act was such an important addition in 2002. And it has been shown to work from the high profile scandals to the day to day statistics that we use in this place. It is an important part of our democracy, which is why 
the report that we got from the Information Commissioner is so concerning because it points to uh, uh, conduct and behaviours from the government which do not uphold this important element, aspect of our democracy, from a lack of clarity on request handling to the influence of special advisers in terms of clearance and as a, as a, a filtering function, evidence of deliberate delay of information while comms plans are put in place, inadequate record keeping, and a perhaps, I think, above all else, the most worrying finding, the twin track FOI process for those members of the public it's being separate from members of the press and indeed members of this place. And it is why I think that the Minister would do well to take the words of the Commissioner more seriously when he says that the changes requ are required for consistency both with the letter and the spirit of freedom of information law. It is not good enough to dodge the question whether or not the law has been broken. The question is there in the report for the government to answer. And indeed, I think the seriousness of the, freedom, uh, of the Commissioner's report is, is, su is, is uh, made clear by the fact he requires changes by September of this year. The reality is the Scottish Government is failing to uphold, I think, the standards that we all expect of it when it comes to transparency, and that is not limited to freedom of information. And I think it is disappointing that the Minister uh, confined his remarks to freedom of information requests, because I think the issue goes much broadly than that even on the most basic and fundamental issue in terms of ministerial correspondence. Correspondence might seem mundane, but it is vital to the work that we do in this place. It is the lifeblood of what we do in order to gain answers and insight for our constituents. But the reality is that even on this, the government is falling behind where our expectations would want them to be. Acknowledgements, simple acknowledgements are taking two weeks or more to be received and the reality of this is this means that constituents are regularly uh, waiting six weeks or more and up to ten in order to gain answers because it's the same old tweets that we see time and time again in the public sector delaying the acknowledgement to gain more time to give uh, 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 to, for, to provide answers and see due process but likewise on minutes and again I would like the minister to provide some clarity on the government's view as to whether or not they need to do better on minutes because again understanding who the government is meeting for what purposes and what commitments are given when they have meetings is vital and can I just maybe gently suggest that the government look at the mayor of London's office I can tell the chamber that on the 19th of April the deputy mayor met with the deputy commissioner of the Metropolitan Police along with two uh, 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 of officials from City Hall I can tell you that because they published the minutes on a bi-monthly basis. It's up there on the website. It's simple and straightforward. There's not a lot of detail, but enough detail to see who was there and what was being discussed. It's a simple suggestion. It's not very complicated. And I fail to understand why this government can't be open and transparent on who they meet and when they meet. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, strict four-minute speeches, please. Ben McPherson, followed by Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Like others, I welcome this debate today and, in general, the serious tone of this debate. Because, presiding officer, as has been said already, the transparency of government and public agencies, and indeed of, of private companies as well, matters to us all. It is in the public interest that appropriate information can be obtained, analysed and considered. Media scrutiny of government is an essential part of our democratic process. And so, I welcome the report. And also remind the Chamber that we should be proud that Scotland has the most open and far-reaching freedom of information laws in the UK and that the 2000 and Act, uh, 2002 Act was passed by a previous administration and has been enhanced by this SNP government. I welcome the report which calls for greater clarity on the processes and procedures surrounding, surrounding FOI requests. And importantly, I also welcome that the fact that the report recognises that the Scottish Government has already taken steps in the past 12 months to improve its freedom of information practice. The Minister said, and I agree with him, that the Scottish, and I very much welcome this rather, that the Scottish Government accepts the Commissioner's recommendations in full, which we should all welcome, and will develop an action plan as required by the Commission to be published in September this year. And in welcoming that action plan, I would suggest that members should vote for the government amendment, which makes that clear. I think it's also important to 
recognise that while we are having this debate today, and of course uh, the report's recommendations should be taken forward, and as I've said, the government is already going to do that in full, we should recognise that our freedom of information legislation is widely recognised as being robust. The Scottish Government is better at responding to FOI requests than previous administrations and better than the UK Government. And you think of um, the, the status in terms of the fact that in 2017, 2,441 requests were answered on time, which is 83% of total requests. In comparison, in the last years of the previous administration, only 61% of requests were responded to on time. Furthermore, in the first four months of 2018, the Scottish Government responded to 93% of requests on time, ahead of the 90% target agreed with the Scottish Information Commissioner. Now, this effective performance is also in recognition, should be recognised in the, in the context of the fact that freedom of information requests to the Scottish Government have been steadily increasing with 3,046 requests received in 2017, 41% more than the previous record of 2,155 in 2015. And I think it's also worth noting that last year the Scottish Government also responded to more than 5,000 requests minute. outside of the FOI system. So there's that proactive response without needing to, uh, out with the freedom of information system. I have uh, been in touch with the Minister also on the point around the draft order extending freedom of information to registered social landlords and received a very comprehensive response to my written question today, which I'm grateful for, outlining the process that that draft order is being taken forward. Presiding officer, in the time I have left, just to conclude, I would like to state, of course, that the Scottish Information Commissioner noted multiple steps that the Scottish Government has already taken since last year to improve and monitor its performance with regards to freedom of information requests and that the increased staff at the Freedom of Information Unit has been uh, increased since 2017. The welcome that the Government is taking you forward the recommendations please. in full and uh, look forward to seeing the action report in September. Oliver Mundell followed by Alex Rowley. Presiding officer, this SNP government talks about openness, accountability and transparency, but the truth is the rhetoric does not match the reality. We only need to look at yesterday's court judgment on fracking to see the depths the SNP are willing to go to. Presiding officer, the people of Scotland have had enough and deserve far better than a government more interested in saving face than providing the facts. The Information Commissioner's report is just the tip of the iceberg. But importantly, it does reaffirm what many already know, that there is a casual disregard for transparency and a deep-rooted culture of arrogance when it comes to freedom of information at the highest levels of this government. The report makes for grim reading, and no amount of cherry-picking or claims of progress can excuse the appalling practices it identifies. I found it doubly depressing to read the report having witnessed many of the issues it highlights during the Education Committee's recent consideration of the Children and Young People Information Sharing Bill, where the lack of clarity and information provided by the Scottish Government fell below the level of transparency both the public and this Parliament should rightly expect. This led to a number of freedom of information requests being made. Presiding Officer, I must say it is a sad state of affairs when parliamentarians are relying on freedom of information requests to get even the most basic information out of the government. However, what is even worse is that these requests did not solicit the full or accurate responses one would expect. Indeed, on multiple occasions since last October, I and others have sought factual information regarding the Scottish Government's engagement with committee witnesses in an attempt to establish the timeline of events. On multiple occasions, the responses uh, that have been received are either incomplete or inaccurate. And what concerns me most is the fact that a number of these omissions and errors have related to information which casts doubt on the original version of events given by John Swinney. In a number of instances, these omissions and errors have unfairly cast doubt on the action as, and integrity of others. I will not make accusations that cannot yet be substantiated, but there's no denying the emerging pattern. Clearance of FOI requests deliberately delayed, 
damaging emails omitted due to inadequate systems and processes, and of course, my favourite, the downright selective release of emails. Astonishingly, when John Swinney wrote to the committee on the 15th of March, he presented a handful of pages of emails as being representative of the government's communication with committee clerks. Interestingly, when the Scottish Parliament itself was FOI'd, the equivalent correspondence runs to 70 pages and tells a completely different story. We still don't have all the answers and I remain deeply concerned about the damage this episode has done to the Parliament. And I believe that far too often this SNP government get let off the hook. I have not given up and I remain convinced that it's only a matter of time until the facts come out in the wash or at least in the next round of FOIs or the round after that or the round after that because if you keep going with this Scottish Government eventually uh, emails turn up, inform new information comes to light uh, and it's never uh, very favourable uh, to the Government. Presiding Officer, this is just one example of the SNP's secret Scotland but my own experience and exasperation gives me a great deal of sympathy uh, with the concerns ra raised by journalists and other MSPs. And that is why I would urge colleagues across the chamber to send the government a message at decision time. Enough is enough. Thank you. Alex Rowley, followed by Kate Forbes. Presiding officer, this building we stand in today was designed in such a way as to reflect open, inclusive and transparent government. It was intended to be a space where the public could visibly see the workings of their government and create a shift away from the perception of government being something that is far removed and lives in a bubble. Openness, transparency, government of the people, by the people, for the people. Freedom of information was a key step towards in breaking down further the barriers faced by the public in seeing what their government are doing. When Labour introduced freedom of information, I must assume they knew it could well make life more difficult for government. But nevertheless, they did so because it was the right thing to do. And that is why it is the right today that Labour highlight the unacceptable situation we find ourselves in, where we have a Scottish Information Commissioner highlighting major flaws in the approach of the Scottish Government in handling requests for information. No matter the political colour of the government, they have a responsibility to the people of Scotland to be consistent with both the letter and the spirit of the law. The way that the SNP government have been dealing with information requests is not acceptable. And it is right that this parliament says so in standing up for the democratic rights of all the people of Scotland. It is not for the SNP government to decide what people can and cannot be told. And it is not for the SNP government to treat requests differently based purely on who's asking. The Commissioner's report criticised the practice of referring requests for clearance by ministers simply because they came from journalists, from MSPs and from researchers. As the Commissioner said, in most cases it should not matter who asked for the information. The Commissioner also highlighted the fact it took longer to respond to journalist requests and made seven recommendations for further specific improvements to clearance procedures, quality assurance, training, case handling and record management, as well as monitoring and review procedures. So the message to this SNP government is clear. Get your act together and respect the democratic rights of all the people of Scotland to access information. You now have the opportunity to listen to the information commissioner. He has given the government the opportunity to fix these issues and we must in this chamber demand that the government does so. I would reiterate Labour's view that this is also an opportunity to look at ways of improving freedom of information, extending the powers to all aspects of public service and making Scotland a world leading example of open and transparent democracy. There needs to be clarity on the role of special advisers. The practice of not taking proper records and minutes of meetings must end. 
the government have a chance to fix this. I do hope so they take that chance. Call Kate Forbes to be followed by Brian Whittle. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and apparently I'm the relevant PLO for, it, for this. As a big believer in freedom of information and a former and occasional, uh, occasionally current FOI submitter, I've got no problem in supporting the government's amendment, which states that the Scottish Government has accepted the Commissioner's recommendations in full and will develop an action plan as required by the Commissioner to be published in September 2018. And despite the opposition's claims, the Scottish Information Commissioner's report recognises that the Scottish Government has already taken steps in the past 12 months to improve its FOI practices and that these changes have, and I quote, already resulted in a number of significant improvements to the Scottish Government's FOI performance. And that is right, because media scrutiny of the work of this government and any other government is absolutely essential to the reliability and the openness of our democratic processes and should be welcomed by all of us. I can think of countless reports in this week alone when the press has brought to our public attention the actions and behaviour of international policymakers, which range from heartbreaking to disgraceful or both, as in the case of the immigration centres. And without their work, we would not know there would be no outcry and there would be no pressure for change. Back in Scotland, back in Scotland, FOIs are an important tool for the independent press. Scotland needs a healthy and honest press, never more so than at a time of conflicting reporting, social media and quote unquote fake press. Kezia Dugdale. The member for giving way. If the free press are so important, why did our government make sure that journalists were treated differently and that answers were longer to be responded to? Kate Forbes. In actual fact, the Commissioner stated that the percentage of refused requests for journalists was actually lower than it was for other requester types, 10% uh, to 13%. The Minister has listed the government's plans to make changes and to take steps to improve the FOI process further. And so I want to use my time to emphasise why I think that's important. FOIs are quite simply a means of accountability. Andy Whiteman used the word uncomfortable, and I think that is an excellent word to use, whether I speak as an elected politician or not, as a member of the party of government or opposition, I value the legitimately uncomfortable scrutiny of the press. It's something I value locally and nationally, and I've worked, I've got four minutes. Um, and I've worked hard to support the local papers in my own rural Highland constituency, whether that's the West Highland Free Press, the Rochester Journal, or the Strathy, to name just three papers, which do a sterling job of holding local politicians to account. And I'm sure my Highland colleagues who are leading the opposition's debate can testify to that. At a time when national circulation figures seem to be forever falling, these local papers are still relatively well read, still employ excellent journalists, and still set the local agenda. FOIs are a key part of that because it makes information equally accessible and it enables everybody, whatever they are in this country and whoever they are, to equally hold decision makers accountable. So notwithstanding the comments made by journalists and the opposition, which as I can see are being taken on board by the Scottish Government, the Scottish Government has welcomed and cooperated with the Scottish Information Commissioner's review and appear to be happy to accept the recommendations in full to support the continued improvement. I think that is right and proper. I call Brian Whittle to be followed by George Adam. Hey, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think we all agree that full transparency in government is a key requirement in holding the Scottish Government to account and that responsibility for the transparency in this place lies within the Scottish Government, who, to be fair, I think uh, responded positively and joined all uh, opposition parties last year when voting in the chamber following that debate, highlighting the issue of 23 journalists complaining in an open letter about the SNP's handling of FOI requests. However, here we are again, almost a year to the day, debating the self-same issue. Uh, the report by the Information Commissioner and the subsequent intervention by his office, I think it's quite remarkable, not least because it indicates a willingness by the Scottish Government to bury bad news and prevent negative headlines. It has even suggested that Nicola Sturgeon's ministers are breaking the FOI laws 
by creating a two-tier system that treated journalists, MSPs and researchers more harshly. And the Deputy Leader John Swinney, no less, was found to have interfered in an FOI request to block the publication of several documents where emails show that uh, Mr Swinney said it would be better if material was withheld and special advisers subsequently looking for technical exemptions to withhold documents that the Minister would prefer not to be released. Now, just because Ministers would prefer documents not to be released is not sufficient reason to withhold them, no matter how politically damaging or embarrassing the content may be to the Scottish Government. Now, I have to say, in cross-party groups I have attended, the response to FOIs and written questions is consistently raised by the group members. In a recent dual CPG on chronic pain and arthritis and MSK conditions, it was a particular pain point, if you'll pardon the pun, Deputy Presiding Officer. Out of every CPG, we always try and put forward some positive actions, usually including sending questions to the Scottish Government. But the standard of reply from the Government has been appalling, which necessitates a further question mirroring the first question. No, no wonder the amount of FOIs and P uh, P PQs is rising so quickly. And I have found myself actually answering for the Government's reluctance to give it information, uh, explaining the process and then suggesting resubmitting the same questions. And I wanted to highlight a recent example that uh, my colleague Finlay Carson made requesting, uh, when asking ministers about the land held by Scottish ministers in connection with the A75. And the reply was, and I quote, while it is recognised there may be some public interest in the details of land held by public ministers in connection with the A75 trunk road, specifically along the margins of the road itself, clearly we cannot provide information which we do not hold. So in the space of a sentence, we are told that details of land held by Scottish ministers may be of public interest, but Scottish ministers apparently know what, don't know what land they hold. I'm, sure that, I'm not quite sure what's worse here, failing to tell people what land Scottish ministers hold or admitting that apparently Scottish ministers don't know what land they hold. I have I've also asked the Scottish Government many times about the A77 south of Whitlitz uh, and how many times uh, that, that, that road has been closed. Hamza Yusuf's reply is, the detailed information is currently being collated. I will write to the member as soon as the information is available. Trouble with that response, of course, is it was dated March 2018, three months ago. I'm finding transport, health, education are the port portfolios most at fault here, and they also happen to be the one under most pressure for underperformance. The Scottish Government cannot choose which questions it will or won't answer based on how it happens to be underperforming at the time. This game of question and answer ping pong has got to stop, Deputy Presiding Officer. If the Scottish Government want the volume of FOIs and PQs to reduce, then don't make us ask the same question repeatedly to get a half-decent answer. Follow the protocols that are already set out. It's not good enough, I'm afraid. I would ask the Scottish Government to take action which reflects the verbal commitment they have made in this chamber. Deputy Presiding Officer. The last of the open debate contributions is from George Adam. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This is a very important debate because how any government conducts itself while going about its business is very important. But I think we have to look at this honestly and be honest about the de debate. And I was going to mention what Edward Mountain did, Tony Blair's quote, or after all, because Tony Blair was the father of FOI. But uh, Tony Blair actually went further with that quote. And though, though I don't agree with what he said, you can understand and respect part of his point of view. Tony Blair claimed later that FOI is not used for the most part by the people. He added, for political leaders, it's like saying to someone who's hitting you in the head, hey, try this instead and handing them a mallet. Now, effectively, this is a, a leader that's gone through many things and had different ideals throughout the point. So his point of view, although I don't agree with, you can understand where he's coming from because there's been a number of mallets brought out here today. But in any honesty, in, in all honesty, freedom of information has progressed uh, since Tony Blair's government uh, brought it forward. And there's been an awful lot of data and things changed as this has progressed in the world as well. So obviously it's going to be more difficult while processing all that as well. But with that, the Scottish government is doing well in this aspect of transparency. Still not perfect, but doing better. In 2017, there were 2,441 requests answered on time. 83% presiding officer, that's not a bad return. This is an extra 300 more requests than from 2015 or 2016. In 2017, just in a moment, uh, 3,046 requests were received. This is incredible, 41% more than the previous record of 2,155 
in 2015. Mr Mountain. Edward Mountain. Thank you, uh, presiding officer. Thank you. Uh, I thank the member for taking an intervention. My concern is that the number of freedom of information requests are going up because none of them are being answered. And most of us are having to submit them more than one freedom of information request to try and get an answer to the straightforward question. George Adam. The answer to that, no technology and openness and transparency is actually more and people are engaging more with the process. I would say that is the reason for the increase in numbers. And it is also important to add, while we're talking about this, that during the first four months of 2018, the Scottish Government responded to 93% of requests on time. This is, of course, ahead of the 90% figure agreed with the Scottish Information Commissioner. And the Commissioner's report recognises that the Scottish Government has already taken steps in the past 12 months to improve its FOI practice. There are, this does, of course, bring me to FOI requests from the media. We all can agree that the media scrutiny of government's work is an essential part of the political process. Last year, the Scottish, gov uh, the Scottish Government responded to more than 5,000 requests from journalists out with the FOI system. In the last month, the Scottish Government dealt with 449 inquiries from the media. The Scottish Information Commissioner acknowledged that spe specific improvements had been made on FOI requests. And he went as far as to actually say in the report on page 28, what we can also observe is a significant improvement in 2017-18 with average response time from dealing with media cases reducing to 19 days. So that shows, presiding officer, that things have been moved forward and the government have taken on board many of the issues brought up. I'm just closing Mr. at this Adams point closing. at the moment. So transparency and openness in any government is extremely important. And I think when we're having this debate, we have to move away from the extreme hyperbole in the debate. There has been much of that in this debate. And although currently the system is not perfect, there has been a positive direction of travel by the Scottish Government. This is an important point, presiding officer, and that direction of travel must continue to be encouraged. We now move to the closing speeches. If you'd keep to time, please, I call Rachel Hamilton up to four minutes. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm glad to have the opportunity to close this debate for the Conservatives. And whilst listening to this debate, it appears that the reason that perhaps there has been an increase in FOIs is because there's a lack of information from the Scottish Government or a lack of transparency. Um, and I fully support freedom of information. Information, as we've heard today, everybody here in this chamber does. The aim of this legislation is to be as open and transparent as possible on the substance of information. The Scottish Government should not be based on secrecy, secrecy and control. We know that FOIs work, showing, for example, mismanagement of our NHS. And they're an effective way to hold any government to account. Denying elected members, their staff and journalists access to information or deliberately slowing down that process is a practice that belongs to a dictatorship, not a democracy. Rhoda Grant said that this is a wake-up call for the Scottish Government, and it certainly is. And I congratulate the work by journalists and MSPs in bringing these practices to light. Ministers and their special advisers should not be the judge who can and who can't get information, never mind already being the decision makers on what information gets released to the public. FOIs are a legitimate method of sourcing information that is not already in the public domain. No minister or SPAD should stand in the way of this. You can imagine, presiding officer, how the SNP backbenchers would howl if it was the other way around. But it's not. This is the SNP Scottish Government ducking and diving from information that is not favourable to them. The minister was asked how many times the Scottish Government broke the law. No answer and rumbled by Neil Finlay. It is right that we debate this today to give the Scottish Government an opportunity to restore public confidence and trust. It is a damning report and the Information Commissioner has given the Scottish Government until the 13th of September to produce a draft action plan for approval to address the recommendations. The Government's habit of referring media requests for clearance by political advisers is contrary to the spirit of FOI legislation. The report advised the Scottish Government undertakes a detailed review of clearance procedures to clearly set out the roles of special advisers. And that also outlining the procedures when case handlers and special advisers disagree and introducing clear rules for recording of decisions. The report said, the current procedure for clearance of information requests are unclear and lacking in detail. This makes the role of those involved opaque when it should be transparent. The report also recommended that the Scottish Government examine procedures in order to learn from poor initial decisions and prevent 
recurring failures and investigate if quality assurance would be better carried out by staff within uh, directorates or agencies instead of special advisors. The report called to um, give media requests waiting an average of two days longer than others and 25% issued late a fairer hearing. It is inherently wrong that a class of requesters is treated differently when re processing requests for information solely because of who or what they are. This covers not only journalists but also MSPs and political researchers. Darren Fitzhenry castigated the way Scottish ministers handled FOI requests as inherently wrong and the report calls for the government to ensure case handlers have sufficient knowledge and training to deal with requests. And in the case of the report recommended the government to improve record keeping to ensure FOI performance is properly tracked and improve the time for response rates. The government motion shows a lack of understanding, I'm afraid, and the Scottish Conservatives have misgivings about the motion. We would have preferred to have seen the Scottish Government get their house in order. They have promised to implement the report's recommendations in full, and we do recommend that. The Scottish Conservatives, in the name of Edward Mountain, would like to call on the Informationer, Information Commissioner to, public, pu to publish an annual report on the Government's implementation of the Action Plan. And we hope that tonight we will receive support for that too. Thank you. I call Joe Fitzpatrick. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Fitzpatrick. Thank you, um, Presiding Officer. Alex Rowley, and, and I apologise if I'm misquoting him, said that we should listen to the Commissioner. And, and I hope from my earlier comments, members will accept that we are listening to Commissioner um, and that we acknowledge that the Commissioner, in his intervention report, that has made clear several areas uh, for improvement um, of our handling process and that we are determined to take those forward and make those improvements. In the light of the Commissioner's recommendations, I think I've already said several times that we will publish an action plan by the 13th of September as, as he requests. However, I would urge members to note that there have been considerable improvements already in place as part of the wider work in train in the Scottish Government. More resources committed to our central FOI unit Review responses essentially being cleared, significant um, improving quality, and I think I'm going to need to make, I've got four minutes, um, and there's a few points I think I need to cover. Um, significant improvement, significantly improving um, quality and consistency, and for almost a year we have published um, information released in response to requests online, over 1,800 such publications to date. Following a concerted effort, um, our performance has also improved significantly in the last year. As George Adams said in 2016, we responded to 76% requests. 2017, that moved up to 83%. And so far this year, we're sitting at 93%. And we're continuing to work to see what we can do to improve our overall performance. And, and it should be clear, also important to point out, that in the majority of these cases, uh, information is released. Against the backdrop of record uh, numbers of requests, also um, pointed out by George Adam, this government is releasing more information on time than any previous government. The release and publication of information in response to FOI requests is only one part of our uh, wider openness agenda. As Ben McPherson said in 2017, the Scottish Government responded to more than 5,000 requests from journalists separate and in addition to those handled under FOI. And it's, it, it's important, I think, to, to make the point that our fantastic officials respond to the overwhelming majority of those media requests in, in less than three hours. Um, Daniel Johnson um, made the point about ministerial correspondence, which, because of the shortness of this, this debate, we didn't have a huge amount of time to um, discuss. But um, in 2017-18, the Scottish Government received 43,000 pieces of ministerial responses, um, of which 90% were answered with on time. But of course, I've previously already men mentioned the new systems that we're putting in place, which will, I hope, as well as helping improving our FOI performance, improve the tracking of ministerial uh, correspondence. Um, as referred to earlier, a wealth of information is made available on the Scottish Government's website. Details of all ministerial engagements, overseas travel, car journeys, domestic travel, ministerial gifts and guests are listed um, published and uh, listed are published proactively on gov.scot. And as announced in my opening remarks from July, we will proactively publish ministerial travel um, and subsistence expenses. But we're always looking 
for examples of good practice elsewhere. And I take on board the point that Daniel Johnson has made in terms of um, the, the practice around the, 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 the Mayor of London's office. And I, I will look to see whether there is, there is lessons to be learned from there, because I think that is absolutely in line with our approach to try and make sure that this Scottish Government is an exemplar in uh, freedom of information. Presiding officer, freedom of information forms a critical part of the wider transparency agenda. We will, in line with the Commissioner's recommendation, um, make changes and, and reform where it is required. Um, we will continue to drive forward improvements in performance. We will take on board the points made by the Liberal Democrats in terms of looking to further expand. I, I know the point about um, the desire for legislation here, but there is a, is a legal framework process which requires that consultation. But I'm very much on the same page that the Liberal Democrats are on, and I, I, I thank them for the way they've approached this, this, um, this matter. I think we, we, it is worth acknowledging that when FOI was Would introduced close, please, to the, 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 the Scottish Government, uh, the Scottish Executive that was then, I think it was the Liberal Democrats who were in the driving seat in those days. I call Dale Finlay to wind up this debate for up to five minutes, please, Mr Thanks, Finlay. Thanks, President Officer. And uh, before I start, can I invite all members to the uh, Campaign for Freedom of Information uh, meeting tonight in Committee Room 1 at 6 o'clock, where they will tell us what they think of the Information Commissioner's report. Um, we've had some very good speeches today from Rhoda Grant, Daniel Johnson, Edward Mountain, Alec Rowley, Brian Whittle, uh, excellent contributions and we've had um, very ambitious speeches I think I could say from Kate Forbes and uh, Ben McPherson I'm sure you will be rewarded in due course and we've had another dreadful performance I have to say from the minister who every time he comes to this parliament to talk about this issue gets his cell into a bigger mess every time but I have to say I think the most inviting and tempting speech of today was the offer to take a mallet to George Adam please form an orderly queue Everyone, um, can I? Uh, I'm only joking, George. Um, please, uh, President Officer. The, uh, can we have a bit of peace? Can we have a bit of peace and quiet? President Officer, Carry on, Mr. Finlay. The report comes after an unprecedented action where 23 of our most respected journalists wrote to this Parliament concerned about the way the FOI was being mishandled. Uh, at that time, I suggested then that it may have been deliberate. Now we know it was deliberate. Journalists and researchers and MSPs discriminated against because of who they are. Uh, this was a deliberate policy decision of this government. And the report raised many issues, uh, including the role of special advisers. The, uh, it goes on to say that the Scottish Government's FOI policies and procedures are not clear enough about the role of special advisers in responding to FOI requests. Formal guidance for staff was ambiguous, right, with the Scottish Government's guidance on obtaining clearance before issuing a response, advising staff that, and I quote, if you are unsure whether you, are a, you think a case requires to be cleared, cleared by special advisers or ministers, please contact the SPADS office for a steer. Yet when interviewed for the Commissioner's report, the SPADS denied they cleared anything. And then it went on to say, site examine of, examination of case files identified numerous instances of delay in is issuing of responses due to delays in obtaining clearance from special advisors. It said this, the letter and spirit of the law were not being met and that politically sensitive information was being treated differently. Let me interpret that for the minister. The government broke the law. And it made seven recommendations for further specific improvements. The clearing procedures as to why SPADs and ministers were screening FOI replies. Quality assurance, who's responsible, what comes out of government and when it comes. Training, who has and hasn't been trained. Case handling and case record management. We've all uh, been denied FOIs and told because it's too costly uh, to accumulate the information. The reason it's too costly is because the records management is so bad. Monitoring FOI requests, who is accountable? The Commissioner says at one point, following a meeting, I requested a copy of the full tracking report from the FOI uh, tracker up to the 17th of December 2017. After some considerable technical difficulties, on the 16th of March 2018, I received the tracking report three months later. President Officer, this is about the time that we often wait for freedom of information requests to come back. So I say to the C Commissioner, welcome to the club. Uh, journalists, uh, complaints the journalist complaints have com been completely vindicated. The government has been caught buying to write, certainly. 
I wonder, Joe Fitzpatrick. I wonder if the member will welcome the fact that the Scottish Government have agreed to implement all of the Commissioner's recommendations. I welcome. Neil Finlay. Of course I welcome that. But it should never have come to this because you shouldn't have been operating a system so bad. And there's much more that we have to do. Often when we use FOI, we're told that minutes and uh, agendas and briefings around meetings don't exist. I've previously asked for meetings. Uh, uh, minutes and briefings and agendas for meetings between John Swinney and senior, senior financiers, Derek Mackay and senior officials at the SFT, Hamza Yusuf and Scott Rail, Nicola Sturgeon and newspaper editors, Nicola Sturgeon and Charlotte Street Partners. No minutes, no agenda, no briefing. Can I ask the Minister and invite the Minister to tell us why there's no minutes of those meetings? Absolutely You're in your nothing. last minute, Mr Finlay. So we need further information, we need a further inquiry that takes into account all of these issues because it's not just about freedom of information, it's about all those meetings that the government has with very powerful people spending money on behalf of the public that no one would ever know happens because there are no minutes, there's no agenda, there's no briefing. So this is the government's opportunity to put all of that right as well as what's in the Information Commissioner's report. Thank you. That concludes the debate and a review of government FOI handling and record keeping. We'll now move on to the next item of business. Would you quickly change seats, please?